Well, hello, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Armin Schneider. As you can see, I'm a digital sovereignty specialist uh, out of Germany. Um, and our topic today is giving a very quick intro uh, on the European Sovereign Cloud, which is upcoming very soon. Um, the challenge is to do it in 20 minutes, but I'll try my best. Um, all right. Um, before we get directly into the ESC itself, right, I think it's quite important to set some scene on why we did that, what the digital sovereignty landscape is, which kind of requirements we're addressing with this additional offering, uh, and then also taking a deeper look on what the European Sovereignty Cloud is. Right? So if you take a look to the landscape, um, I mean, we're hearing a lot of different things, and they are slightly different across the world, but if you take them in a common scenario, right, we're talking about data residency, who has access to my data from an operator perspective, resiliency, transparency, and then, you know, fairly also very prominent these days, the topic of independence and survivability, right? I mean, what does it take to be independent from whatever independence means? And uh, I can tell you, I mean, in different places of the world, you will have different opinions. Some people think the data needs to stay in their countries. Some people are lucky if the data leaves the country and is protected elsewhere, right? It's a different definition. But if you take those topics, right, and we'll now group them a little bit in a vertical order here, uh, we're basically putting together the data residency and operator access topic as kind of a data sovereignty. Where is my data? Who can access my data? And then on the right-hand side, they have the resiliency and independent stuff as operational sovereignty, summarizing it as a digital sovereignty as a whole, right? I mean, this is a 10,000-foot view on what it is, and there's very little nuances all over the place. But based on this, I mean, about three years back, exactly at this time, uh, we made this statement of the digital sovereignty pledge, and it's basically really the promise from us to say people or customers should have control over the location of their data, they should have control who is accessing their data, encryption a topic, you have to encryption on transit, in use or on the wire, and we also want to provide the, the highest resiliency of the cloud. So that's basically the promise, and a lot of those things have been there before. right? But looking into that a little bit from a timeline perspective, and we don't have to read all of that, right? So if we start from that, from that angle here, and you see 2022 there, we made basically the statement of the Digital Sovereignty Pledge. And during that time, you can see quite a lot of things happened, and they could be either, I mean, announcing a new operational component, technology enhancement, but also technology in relation to contracts, right? And if I take a look to this one example here, at this angle, we had the first attestation of our Nitro system. And the Nitro system for us in the sovereignty space is, a, is one of the core functionality because it gives us this zero operator access capability as a design of the cloud at all, not just the European sovereignty cloud. But while we had Nitro started in 2018, we only came out with a third party attestation that there is no operator access in, you know, almost five years later. Um, and I mean, one of the reasons is it's super hard to prove that something does not exist, right? But having that said, we made this in the party assessment here, but at the same time, we brought it into the service terms, which made it a contractual statement from us. It's not just a paper thing, it's also part of your contract, right? And if you go further down the line, announcement of the European Sovereign Cloud, and now end of 2025, you're basically seeing that we're uh, looking quite close to you know, the release of this. Before we dig into um, the ESC itself, um, let's take a look to a few components, but I think it's important. When we look to the left-hand side, um, we think and we believe that the AWS cloud is sovereign by design, right? And the ESC, we will see that in a minute, is an additional offering with additional things you can get from us, right? But in the governance cloud, I mean, you have all these things like control of your data, encryption, the zero operator access, all of those things exist today, right? But people in different places and different industry have different requirements. So if you go a little bit to the next, right, in countries very specifically where we don't have 
a region in the country, right? A lot of requirements coming from laws that certain data needs to stay in the country borders, right? So outpost is an option where you can put your data in the boundaries of your country, or even if you're in your own data centers, if you want though, so that is one option going into the right, which extending the sovereignty of the uh, regular AWS cloud, right? If you go one step further again, I mean, then you can have, look, an AWS output is not enough. I need more, I need more services, I need a much higher scale. We're basically introduced the concept of dedicated local zones, which is a local zone, but dedicated to a certain customer, typically a group of customer, but let's be honest, that's also quite big investment in order to get to that. But it gives you the benefit that the resources are only for you, and you can even have a certain word on which kind of resources and services we will provide into that. So all of these options, right, I mean, are here shown up as an addition to the commercial cloud environment. And then the next offering on the right-hand side is the AWS Sovereign Cloud. So this is an yet another option, and we will dig into it a little bit deeper, um, very well tied to European Union specific requirements. And they are requirements sometimes from you know, highly regulated or public sector customers. And we did quite a lot of extra components. But if you guys are aware of you know, the components like we do in the Gov Cloud, I mean, you can think about some similarity, even though there are differences uh, compared to that. So let's stick a little bit into it. So the European Sovereignty Cloud, right, is set to launch by the end of the year. So we're, we're basically pretty close to it. Um, it will be a physical separated region and the first region will be starting basically in Brandenburg in Germany. That is pretty close to Berlin, right? Um, and what we're doing here is really a complete new partition, as we call it, with uh, quite a lot of additional component. But what is important to state, and we'll dig deeper into it, right, that it's not only the customer content state within a region, we're also creating all the customer created metadata states in the European Union, right? And we do a completely day-to-day -day operation with people from local entities, which are really need to be on European ground. So it's really also a completely different operation and model, and we'll dig into that. So how did we come to this, right? I mean, uh, about three years back when we announced that, uh, well, we basically looked for requirements across customers, regulatory bodies all over the place on what customers require from us to satisfy certain needs. And while there isn't a common framework available yet across the European Union, I mean, we defined what we now call, and I didn't change the slide last minute, the sovereignty reference framework, which is basically we captured all the requirements which are, which are needed to design the European Sovereignty Cloud, right? Uh, we will make this framework also available quite soon, and it will be also part of our audit processes once the region is launched. So we're not just saying these are the requirements, we're also putting controls in place, which telling you with the evidence from an audit that we're taking those controls. But that's really the base of the design, right? Um, we're having an independence governance structure, though I'll talk about a little bit later on how that looks like. And one of the statements we also made is that we're designed this cloud for indefinitive operation. Though I think that is a quite strong statement because it's not saying it can survive a month or three months or six months, we're stating it is indefinitive operational under whatever circumstances, right? I mean, this requires quite a lot of things to do, and that's what we see on the right-hand side. So we really established a complete new route of trust, right? So the whole certificate authority is separate, the top-level domains are separate, I mean, the IAM system is separate. So it really basically, on a, on a daily operation, it has no dependency on anything else in the world, right? Uh, there is a replica to the source code available in case we need it, and there's also dedicated security operation center. So everything is basically operated out of this own infrastructure. So how does it look like from a governance perspective? So we founded basically four new companies which are operating the ESC. Um, and if we start on the bottom left, so the infrastructure subsidiary it basically owns everything from the physical perspective. So the data center, the location, the networks, the cooling, the power, right? This is what we're doing in other regions as well, but it's an independent company running this. 
Then we have this part in the middle, which is really service teams and people which are operating the European Sovereign Cloud independently. And this includes 24 by 7 technical support and technical account manager out of the European Union. And then on the right hand side, you can see we're having a, a different company just using or holding and owning our root of trust authority, right? It's, it's not too many people in there. They are really the ownership of the, of the PKI infrastructure. On top of this, there is then basically the holding company, uh, which is having managing director as well as an independent advisory board, really controlling um, the stuff underneath. And the concept of this model is, we're physically separated the European Sovereignty Cloud from a network perspective, though you can't access this if you're not on EU ground, right? I mean, I could try, I have access to it, I could try it from here, it's not gonna work, right? Um, and basically, therefore, everything is being controlled by the management of these companies under European law. I mean, this is basically there. What we have done on top as well, we have an advisory board with, with uh, memberships with non-AWS or Amazon employees who are getting also full transparency. You can see, I mean, we're quite invested a little bit also on this infrastructure part because it is on the one side, side technology, so network separation, independent stacks, but it's also, I mean, uh, an organization and thing on top of it. I mean, who is owning it, who is controlling it, who is making decisions about it. So, if you go one step further, um, as I said, the people which are operating the European Sovereignty Cloud are supposed to be employed and need to be resident in the European Union. Um, and they need to be located in the EU for operational purposes. The ESC so will be open from customer all over the world. It is an internet connected cloud. But for us as a cloud operator, we can only operate it while we are in the EU boundaries and while we're basically employed with one of those entity in our EU residence. Um, we also made an announcement that this will change in the future uh, toward EU citizenship. Right. Um, that has been a change in the requirements, so we're also adopting that, uh, probably not right now. So long story short, I mean, it's really full control of the operations. On that, even so, we're still using the same global code because we don't want to lose the agility of the cloud. So we're basically using the code base, but these teams are controlling it, can stop it, can roll back, and though they have the full control of the operation. Um, if you go one step further, looking into the, the data perspective, I mean, what you see here on the left-hand side, customer content stays in the region you choose. This is true for the commercial cloud today, right? I mean, for 95% of our services, they are regional or zonal services. You select the region, we're not, we're not transferring the data out. However, what is potentially leaving the region by the nature of a global cloud is what we call customer-created metadata. Though so that could be namespaces, so the name of an S3 bucket is a global namespace. So if the name contains any kind of you know, sensitive data for you, which are people advise not to put sensitive data in there, but it's potentially being able to leave the region because it's metadata in a global partition. Within the European Sovereignty Cloud, everything stays in the European Union, which means stays in that partition. So think about it, look, this is actually a new region with a, a similar thing like US East 1 in 2006. Right. So data difference is really on the right-hand side. What you have on the left-hand side is the true as well. What we are also seeing, and this is something I think on the, no, it's not on this slide, it's, it's missing here. Uh, while we are having an own IAM system, we're all having an own DNS system, also these data, like roles and permissions, are independent and staying also within the region of the European Sovereignty Cloud. Um, having that said, I mean, there's also separate billing for the European Sovereign Cloud, and people can also choose to bill in Euro if they just want to. Right? So there will be also a, a local billing system, though they're also not billing data as leaving the region. All right, so if you go next, um, if you take a look to this, I, I, I avoided to use a slide where all the services are listed because it's not readable, but if you go to this hyperlink, uh, you will see we will launch the region with uh, roughly about over 80 services, which is more services than in any other new region when we, when we launch them, right? And why I'm saying this, the goal here is 
the ESC was supposed to be a full flavored cloud. We don't want that to be a limited cloud with a handful of services and limited functionality. It's really supposed to be a fully flavored cloud. And if you go to the link, you will see all the services we will launch with. And as in other, any other region, there is more to come. I mean, we're basically building additional services and we'll also launch a roadmap. But if you look into it, it's a quite no, strong number of services right away. Um, as also then, because in order to be a full global cloud, I mean, also a huge number of already assigned launch partners. And there will be also an independent marketplace because we will also want to have customers to have the capabilities to use stuff from the marketplace and use all those components which they are used to have in there. Um, important to say, I mean, those partners are sometimes operational partners. Those partners are people who are on the SaaS provider side. And there is quite a mix of all of them, but there's a huge number of people also having the sovereignty compensant thing. Because I think it's important to mention, I mean, we have put it our sovereignty requirement framework and boundaries for us, right? But if a customer is operating on us, right, I mean, and their customers are probably demanding a similar component because it doesn't help if you're just deploying your software on a sovereign cloud, if your operations concept is not sovereign what your customers are asking for. So that's where we're also looking into the um, competency component. Um, we're still not forcing people. I mean, whenever a customer is doing something on the European sovereign cloud, it is in their responsibility but it's, it's highly advisable to also look to those competency because we believe if people make the decision to go to the European Sovereign Cloud because they have these requirements, well, they should take it in a full picture. Well, having that said, we also think, you know, people need to take a look to the requirement if they need the additional component of the European Sovereign Cloud. This is certainly not a one size fits all, and it's just an additional offering to what we already have in the commercial cloud and the things like outposts and dedicated local zones. So having that said, though, if customers said, look, I mean, this first region is in Germany, but I'm in another uh, state of the European Union, I want to have dedicated local zone or outposts connected to it, that's, that's possible as well. It's, it could be an extension of the ESC as it is an extension of the commercial cloud. But the general concept really is to have a full flavored cloud uh, and really having all the services and functionality knowing right, that you can't make a one-to-one -one comparison on day one, right? Um, and yeah, then, uh, I mean, last slide, I mean, the, the region is still you know, supposed to launch uh, by tw the end of 2025. Uh, we'll uh, basically have not yet made an announcement on it, but we'll, we'll certainly do. Uh, and then, as I said, the region will be available in general to everybody. That's also a different, it's not tied to a certain group. I mean. Everybody can sign up for an account in the European Sovereign Cloud. Um, they will be able to create their own account. I mean, keeping in mind there is a new IAM system, though there will be new accounts, there will be also new organization. I mean, the org structure and the government structure needs to be replicated. And if you're operating in both parts of the world, you also need to consider different IAMs, though your federation might go in both places but we are not allowing you to do an assumed role between partition by the nature of it, right? Same thing is true, by the way, for things like networking. It's internet connected, but for example, if customers want to use Direct Connect, there's Direct Connect point of presence for the ESC in parallel to Direct Connect, because the network is by purposely built separated from it. Right. All right, I mean, this is about um, on the content. Uh, I will probably be around if there are questions. Um, and other than that, thank you very much for your attention.